Hi, Professor Azizur Rahman here, and today we're going to talk about how to harness hypertension. Now, I have other videos on different aspects of hypertension. You can watch them if you're interested. But in this one, we are going to talk about treatment of hypertension. Now, why have I labeled it as like harnessing hypertension? That actually means that if you do not control high blood pressure, it could be really wild and it can give you a lot of mortality and morbidity. And that is why it needs to be controlled and kept controlled to prevent all those complications. So in this presentation, I'm going to talk about the treatment part. The treatment also includes initial diagnosis and evaluation. Uh, the first part in diagnosis and evaluation is a careful measurement of blood pressure. There is a separate video on how to measure, but for professionals, it needs to be, I think, just enough to say that calibrated equipment, blood pressure measured carefully in a relaxed person after a patient has rested for five minutes. Now, we mostly make diagnosis on office reading, that is the reading in the clinics, and if somebody has more than 140 by 90 on more than one occasion, he or she can be formally labeled as a case of hypertension. But home blood pressure monitoring is also becoming increasingly important, and the readings more than 135 systolic and more than 85 will make him hypertensive. Readings are lower than office readings because patient is more likely to be physically, mentally relaxed at home and the cut points are different. And if you use ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, which is now also becoming popular, the cut points are even lower because this would also include your night readings when you are very, very relaxed and blood pressure typically comes to much lower level in a normal healthy person because of this dipping phenomenon. So I think different criteria are used, but mostly we use office reading. It has to be multiple readings to call somebody hypertensive and unless one single reading is also very high. Uh, and I think uh, you can for some time you can make the patient aware and just ask him or her to have a follow-up and only when multiple readings are above normal then you can start treating hypertension. Of course, lifestyle changes may be started even at borderline values. Second component of initial evaluation is certain laboratory tests because we want to know if blood pressure uh, is associated with another condition which may be etiology or may be effect and these are the tests which are very readily available and we are cheap urinalysis creatinine kidney function test ecg will show you if there is any left ventricular hypertrophy ultrasonography of abdomen will show you if there is any kidney problem or if there is kidney damage limited echo very important tests will tell you if there is any a left ventricular hypertrophy or at least diastolic dysfunction. These two points, if present, would indicate that hypertension has been there for quite some time and there is some urgency of treatment. Further observation is perhaps not needed. And I use this echo finding as a selling point in somebody who is in a denial phase and will give you an excuse that this particular reading is high only for some temporary reason, but if echo shows left ventricular hypertrophy, uh, which is manifested as thickening of left ventricular posterior wall or interventricular septum, that could be, uh, I think, a convincing point for the patient to start medication or lifestyle changes. Then there are certain complications, we call them hypertension mediated organ damage by initial evaluation we want to see if some damage is already there related to heart brain kidneys and eyes and to determine all this we we use all available tools we use history we use 
physical examination and we use laboratory tests to find out if some of the organs have already shown or developed some damage. That would of course indicate the urgency of treatment. Then in some cases, maybe around 5% of the patient, the hypertension may be due to another cause. So we want to know if there is, this is secondary hypertension. There may be any type of kidney disease, renovascular or renal parenchymal disease can cause hypertension or second number is adrenals and some other organs. I think we need to do the test to find out if there is a cause behind hypertension. In that case, the treatment would be focused on the cause. Uh, the primary hyperaldosteronism is coming up as a fairly common condition that is today typically treated as essential hypertension but if you have the means of making a diagnosis that patient also would require different treatment. Then there are some exacerbators like smoking drugs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, some recreational drugs, excessive alcohol intake, they can aggravate one's blood pressure. So I think they also need to be considered. Then finally, there are some comorbid conditions which may not be related to hypertension as cause or effect, but they are important to know because we do not want to aggravate those conditions by anti-hypertensive medication. One example, patient with asthma, their condition may be aggravated with beta blocker. Asthma may be precipitated by beta blockers, especially non-selective beta blockers. So we don't want to prescribe these drugs to asthmatic patient. So I think this process may take, may, you may do in one uh, session or you could do it in multiple session. Maybe this workup could be extended over a couple of weeks. But I think at the initial diagnosis, this should be completed to define the patient completely. What I mean by that, there could be a patient who has just stage 1 hypertension with no additional risk factors and on the other extreme, there may be another person who has stage 3 hypertension, that means very high blood pressure, more than 180 systolic, more than 110 diastolic, with multiple risk factors for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, that person may be diabetic or has already develop uh, coronary artery disease or atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. So these two persons have been diagnosed with hypertension for the first time, but they are very, very different persons. This patient may be started with lifestyle changes alone and may be followed up maybe after three months. This patient would of course need immediate medication and should be followed up more rapidly, may be required hospitalization for to complete all the workup. So that is why hypertension is actually a syndrome. There is no one size fit all concept here. So we have to define the person and then decide the plan, treatment plan for him. Uh, there are different BP goals for different categories. Uh, for general population, for people with diabetes, for people with chronic kidney disease for people who are elderly. We, we have different goals and let me give you those goals. Uh, for general population, our minimum goal is to get their blood pressure down to 140, below 140 systolic and below 90 diastolic. Now 140 by 90 is not an ideal blood pressure, but it should be below. That is the minimum criteria as defined by JNC Eight. But most physicians and cardiologists feel that we need to bring it further down. It would be more beneficial if we make our goal of 130 by 80. So 130 by 80 would definitely be better than 140 by 90, especially because this will provide some cushion. Because even if somebody is controlled, somebody is taking medication regularly, there would be time when his blood pressure may rise temporarily. So if it is in comfortable mid zone, that will provide some cushion also. So I think our teaching is that the goal should be 130 by 80. We are talking about office reading. If somebody has diabetes, because diabetes and hypertension 
they tend to coexist and they tend to the, their effect on atherosclerotic rotor cardiovascular disease is not only uh, added it is actually multiplied so we would like to keep blood pressure below 130 by 80 all the time and we would also like to use some preferred agents like uh, ACE inhibitors or ARBs would be preferred although JNC says that even in diabetes patient any of the first five line agents can be used but most physicians and cardiologists and some societies they feel that in diabetes ACE inhibitors and ARBs are preferred because of their additional direct vascular protection. In people with CKD the treatment is not only difficult but I think you need to actually again have a more idealistic uh, goals like 130 or 80 less than 130 systolic less than 80 diastolic in elderly people those who are like 75 or older uh, their goal may be different because almost invariably there would be some thickening some stiffening of vessels and blood pressure may not be that easy to be controlled and for that reason 150 may be considered as against 130 here so less than 150 but even in this population you should try to get it below 140 if possible without giving them side effects but I must admit in some patients despite having medication we have to accept blood pressure higher than 140 or 150 because we cannot get it below without lowering their diastolic too much when it comes to diastolic we cannot be very choosy in this category because in uh, elderly people the systolic goes up and diastolic goes down even as a part of normal aging so diastolic whatever we will have to accept if it is if patient has ischemic heart disease maybe less than 50 would be little harmful uh, but otherwise blood pressure diastolic blood pressure of 50 or around 50 is okay so no problem I think as long as we can control upper uh, the systolic pressure around 150 or less so these are different goals but I think we can make just one universal goal that is we will always try to keep it below 130 by 80 in people with CKD and diabetes we will be more particular whereas in in uh, general population with hypertension maybe we, we can accept up to 140 by 90 also but the, of course low the better as I'm going to show you in my next slide now this is very very interesting slide we have different categories of blood pressure and this is where a formal diagnosis of hypertension is made this corresponds to 140 by 90 you can see that on this side as the blood pressure goes up the risk increases and this could go up to eight times and an interesting thing to note is that in the normal range these both categories are normal but the risk of developing atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease is lesser if your blood pressure is in the lower normal range and as your blood pressure increased by 20 by 10 20 systolic 10 diastolic your risk of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease almost doubles now when we treat it it comes down right and typically I, the patient has this high blood pressure in this range and once we start treating now this is the point I would make very assertively when we start treating we do not want to just bring it down its original level here but we would like to bring it to somewhere here why because we want to provide some cushion also so because we know that in the normal range also lower is the better of course if you try to achieve very low patient would develop side effect portion hypertension syncope of course we do not want to do that and patient is not going to be compliant if that happens so minimum in the systolic range which is compatible with the normal life without any side effects I think that is the aim 
Now, there are many agents available. These are the first line. We have thiazides or thiazide-like diuretics, thiazide-like hydrochlorothiazide, thiazide-like diuretic like indepamide, calcium blocking agents, and particularly amlodipine, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors. There are many of them, captopril, enalapril, lisinopril, perindopril, and we have angiotensin receptor blockers. Again, there is a long list. We have losartan, we have velsartan, telmisartan, candesartan, uh, there are other sartans also, so they are all good. Then we have beta blockers. We, we have non-selective conventional beta blockers and now we have selective beta blockers. We have combined alpha and beta blocker like carvedilol. Now we have latest nebivalol which is both beta and alpha uh, blocker and beta part is cardio selector. So that's again a great beta blocker. And we have mineralocorticoid receptor blocker like aldosterone. Uh, that, that is also uh, the, one of the agents. Uh, actually, spironolactone. Aldosterone is to be blocked with aldosterone blocker, the spironolactone that is used for the treatment of hypertension. Now, let me give you some brief characteristics of commonly used antihypertensive. I cannot cover all of them, but some of them, like amlodipine, it is a potent arterial dilator and it is, it is metabolically neutral. It is a good general purpose antihypertensive agent, but it will not disturb uh, one's lipids or uric acid or glucose. And we know that they reduce hypertension mediated organ damage, particularly stroke. But once we use these agents, after initial response, there may be some attenuation of their effect because of activation of RAS and present uh, retention of some water uh, resulting in edema. Why this happens? Because whenever, whenever there is vasodilatation, body will perceive as if there is volume deficiency and body will activate RAS and will start retaining water to uh, correct this perceived problem. Then we have a thiazide type of diuretics, a hydrochlorothiazide. It causes very gentle 24-hour uniform diuresis and has got good blood pressure uh, lowering effect because it reduces body volume. And it also is proven to reduce hypertension mediated organ damage. In fact, uh, these diuretics have been in use for very, very long. Initial recommendation, all preferred uh, di uh, diuretics because of their proven efficacy and low cost. Although these days we consider the, uh, the diuretic as one of the options, they can be used, but they're not necessarily be the first line agent. They also activate RAS and they ca cause volume contraction. Why do they cause activation of ROS? Because they get rid of some extra sodium and water and in response to that RAS gets activated. So again, I think uh, if we add some other drug in both these classes, if we add another drug which can uh, block this activated RAS, that can be beneficial. So that is what will brings me here, angiotensin receptor blockers and angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors. These are both RAS blockers and they have arterial as well as, as, well as venodilatation effect. The advantage over pure arterial dilatation is that they would increase capillary perfusion without causing increased pressure in the capillaries without pushing fluid out of the capillaries, without causing edema. And they are also known to reduce hypertension mediated organ damage. In fact, they have renal protection, they have cerebral vascular protection, and that is why many societies like NICE, they recommend ARBs and ACE inhibitors as the preferred agents in those people who have longer life expectancy like younger people. 
and not only in itself in themselves they are great antihypertensive agents but they would make a very good addition to amlodipine and hydrochlorothiazide because they counter activated ras because of these two drugs a ras is actually activated in hypertension itself also so this would help in all the situations where there is hypertension does it matter which antihypertensive drugs we use i think it does though our primary objective of treating blood pressure is to bring down the blood pressure to a desired level gnc says no matter how you bring it to the desired level it rewards i think that of course is our primary objective but there are some secondary objectives also use appropriate agents for the given patient based on his or her age ethnicity and the presence of comorbidities now this i'm going to discuss in more detail later so we choose of course we this is our primary objective but if we can achieve our primary objective by certain drugs which can extend additional benefits by addressing these comorbidities and age and ethnicity issue that would be preferred so based on these principle jnc says no matter any agent or combination of agent you can use but bring their blood pressure to below 140 by 90 but i think ras blockers their cardio renal protection they are better in diabetes they are better in ckd and they are certainly very good in heart failure in this category we should try to achieve our goals using ras blocker uh, ras blockers i think uh, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors and arbs angiotensin receptor blockers both are generally considered equivalent as far as their efficacy and their benefits are concerned uh, arbs are better tolerated though and stroke prevention amlodipine is particularly helpful in stroke prevention which is common in elderly so in elderly it becomes treatment of choice and also people who are black by ethnicity because these people have low renin and people with low renin they do not respond to ras blockers that well so we use amlodipine as preferred agent there is no 100% fixed rule uh, but we, this is our preference now hypertension is a big topic i have listed these uh, 12 categories where there would be different principles a different approach to the treatment but i am going to talk about this simple neat and clean hypertension by neat and clean hypertension i mean these guys have hypertension with no other very significant comorbidities or mortalities or condition now what is our aim aim is to bring down blood pressure and the first thing we always try and we always start with is lifestyle changes in fact lifestyle changes are to be started and to be continued even if you have to resort to the use of medication lifestyle changes remain important they are usually usually low cost approaches and and patient has much more acceptance although they are not easy to do and they are not easy to carry on but definitely lifestyle changes definitely should be done and continued what are the principles first is dash diet diet should be uh, low in calories and most of the food should not be coming from animal source it should be primarily vegetable source the meat part can come from see the fish food uh, the seafood and it should be less in sodium the processed food is very rich in sodium that should be avoided our conventional foods also some of the foods are very rich in salt i think they should be avoided or consumed in smaller quantities then we have to work on our weight particularly the waist and uh, this pate is actually the waist 
so we have to work on our weight by reducing food intake and by doing regular physical activity minimum is 150 minutes per week it could be cycling jogging swimming running walking or some competitive game more would definitely be better now let me make this point that they, these two have very beneficial complementary action on weight and blood pressure so both should be started together uh, exacerbators uh, there are certain things which can increase your existing blood pressure uh, like use of non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs use of contraceptive pills use of steroids and many other drugs i think you need to go through the prescription and see if somebody is taking all those drugs some recreative re recreational drugs may also increase blood pressure so if possible you should try to take them off these drugs of course sometimes it may not be possible if somebody is taking corticosteroid for a good reason he has autoimmune disease uh, then of course we cannot uh, stop them now as far as pharmacotherapy is concerned we have various hypertension guidelines i cannot go through all of them if you follow any guidelines you have got so jnc8 came in 2014 american college of cardiology american heart association guidelines came in 2017 they actually changed the definition of hypertension uh, this may not be applicable in our country but they use these automated uh, instrument for the measurement of blood pressure and and in the absence of another doctor that typically gives you low reading equivalent to home reading so that is why the lower definition lower cut point was used european society of hypertension and european heart association gave their guidelines in 2018 and they have defined optimal control and essential control i think that concept is a uh, very very applicable in our country and this has been adopted by Inter international society of hypertension also optimal control would be the best control and essential control is the minimum which you should achieve in resource constrained societies nice guidelines are very useful this is uh, british heart association guidelines uh, and uh, they are revised frequently and the latest edition is in 2022 i think the first was released if i'm not wrong somewhere in 2000 uh, somewhere i think 2018 or somewhere uh, so these are the latest one i'm going to talk about in some more detail now this is this is the treatment algorithm given by nice revised in 2022 we start with lifestyle changes lifestyle changes are great and if one can achieve the blood pressure goals with the lifestyle changes alone that control is not only acceptable is actually superior so one should be encouraged to continue lifestyle changes otherwise we will categorize them in two groups those individuals who are younger than 55 they should be preferably started on ras blocker either angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor or angiotensin receptor blockers generally speaking angiotensin receptor blockers are better tolerated so they are prescribed more and more commonly these days uh, ace inhibitors are great they have proven benefits if somebody has no tolerability issue somebody is not having any cough or angioedema they may continue ace inhibitors uh, or they may be started on ace inhibitors ace inhibitors are generally less expensive as compared to arbs so i think it is mostly physicians choice uh, i must say that these days we are prescribing arbs more commonly than uh, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors because of the perceived uh, better tolerability for example we start with velsartan we will maybe start with 80 mg and if that is not able to control blood pressure maybe we can move to 160 after 160 we can further increase it but preferred agent preferred approach would be to add another agent uh, if somebody is 
older than 55 or has got black ethnicity uh, then the patient should be preferably started on amlodipine c is calcium channel blocking agent so amlodipine is considered to be better agent because black people they have low renin uh, the low renin people do not respond that well to ras blockers and elderly people may have this stiffening of blood vessel and their calcium channel blocking agents work better so about 30 percent would be controlled and i've already defined the goals at the first level either ras blocker or calcium channel blocking agents but those who are not at goal in them both these classes may be combined now they initially are combined as separate pills because we can then uh, titrate individual drugs dosage but if you have achieved a certain dosage and if a fixed drug combo is available it may be better to shift to that combo and i will highlight the importance of combination pills in subsequent slides so another 30 percent will be controlled with the ras blockers and calcium channel blocking agents combined if blood pressure is not still controlled then move to step three in step three hydrochlorothiazide or indepamide should be added in three drug regimen we must use thiazides or uh, non-thiazide diuretics some diuretic must be added in fact if you are not controlled with adequate dose of three drugs regimen one of them being a diuretic and and compliance is ensured then you are labeled as a case of a resistant hypertension that will take you to step four and then of course whatever nice doesn't then uh, specify what should be the next agent any agent used like a uh, like methyl lopa or any other drugs may be used uh, but mineralocoid receptor antagonists are preferred over others beta blockers are not mentioned anywhere here they are not in the first year that does not mean that they are not useful they have very very good effects they can be used in some compelling indication and the compelling indication means presence of ischemic heart disease presence of heart failure in low dose and somebody who has got a lot of anxiety palpitation and has got resting tachycardia beta blocker may still be used but beta blockers are generally not used as a monotherapy these days there would be some cases the monotherapy is used but generally speaking beta blockers are used as a as an additional drug as an adjuvant drug added to one of this regimen and usually in a low dose so every patient is actually different so you use the appropriate agent for that given patient now these are european guidelines and they are pretty much the same uh, they follow the same principle but they have made three i think points one is that they say that for majority our starting treatment should be with two drugs why do they say so because in majority single agents is not enough to bring the blood pressure to the goal all studies they have shown that majority people they need two three or four agents so on that basis they say except for those who have very very mild hypertension those who are elderly and frail for majority you should start with two drug combination and the second difference than nice is that they have used diuretic in nice guidelines diuretics are in the second year but european guidelines they say either of the ras blocker or any any of the two between calcium channel blocking agents or diuretic as appropriate and they have also emphasized the use of single pill if these two drugs are available in single pill they advocate using them because studies have shown that taking single pill has got some benefits which i'm going to show you maybe in next slide so 
at any level when you're treating blood pressure at any level you may be confronted with a situation where blood pressure is not goal and you have the option of either doubling the existing agent or adding another agent so i'm going to show you something which will favor adding, uh, adding another agent as recommended by nice also now suppose somebody has this much blood pressure reduction with single agent and if you double the dose of the same drug like for example valsartan from 80 to 160 lisinopril from 10 to 20 there is this much blood pressure further lowering of course this is very impressive but if you add another agent from another class with complementary action and there with the, their blood pressure reduction is even more pronounced so it is more cost effective example is somebody is taking uh, well sartan 160 milligram rather than going to 320 milligram if we add amlodipine 5 milligram that might work better so this is the example on the basis of this we usually prefer to give combination pills and i think another concept is blood pressure the essential hypertension has got multiple abnormalities behind it and multiple um, uh, abnormalities lead to hypertension so it is better if you if you uh, address multiple uh, abnormalities to get better results now let me show you how combination drugs work better the rationale behind it suppose we use amlodipine it would have a certain dose would have certain blood pressure lowering effect great but after some time we will notice that there would be activation of ras this i have already explained in my earlier slide there will be activation of ras and also there may be some retention of water these are effects of uh, any vasodilator particularly uh, amlodipine because these have effects on the arterial side mostly so there would be activation of ras and there would be retention of salt and water due to activation of ras so as a result the initial blood pressure lowering effect may be reduced like this so because of this second effect the blood pressure lowering effect is not maintained and there is now blood pressure started rising so what we do i think we can add certain other agent adding arb or ace inhibitors would mitigate the effect of ras activation and adding a hydrochlorothiazide would affect this water retention so when we make combination of these drugs any of the combination like amlodipine and ras blocker amlodipine with diuretic or all three could be added to come up with various combinations and blood pressure when we block these blood pressure lowering effect is again there and we have a very very good blood pressure lowering effect so this is how these combinations are used and various combinations which are popular is amlodipine with arbs and many of them are available in combination pills also and amlodipine with arb and hydrochlorothiazide all three drug for stage three hypertension if you can recall that algorithm and in the step three we can use these three drugs as separate pills or as combo and rationale of combining two or more antihypertensive drug to sum up this is the summary of the previous slide greater bp reduction due to complementary mode of actions so they have to be two agents with complementary mode of action not just any two cancellation or mitigation of some of the side effects due to opposing action of each drug like for example ras blockers they have the tendency of increasing potassium whereas hydrochlorothiazide can lower potassium so giving together will maintain potassium uh, amlodipine can cause 
uh, edema because of preferential arterial dilatation, increasing intracapillary pressure, pushing fluid out of the capillaries, whereas adding valsartan would also cause additional venodilatation and that would reduce intracapillary pressure although the circulation will be uh, increased and that will minimize pushing fluid out of the capillaries and edema will be reduced. So this is how we combine two classes of drug in single pill to increase the desired effect and to reduce the side effects. So if we have to use multiple agents, how about combining them in single pill? There are some advantages. They reduce pill burden. These patients, nobody wants to take too many pills. Uh, and these patients with hypertension, they may have many other comorbid conditions. They may be already taking too many pills. So if you reduce them, if you give them lesser number of pills, I think that will reduce pill burden and more likely that they will take it. And combining drugs actually reduce cost also. And they, it improves adherence because of reduced pill burden and it should then improve outcomes also because that is our aim. So whenever available, I think we should use uh, the combo pills of complementary acting drugs. Summary of my presentation, hypertension, how to treat. Lifestyle changes must be started for all and should be continued always. RAS blockers or amlodipine or both preferably in single pill. For younger, RAS blocker, for elderly, amlodipine and then we combine them as given in the algorithm. Goal is minimum 130 by 80, particularly for diabetes, uh, a patient with heart failure and CKD. And we should definitely take next action if somebody's blood pressure is touching or exceeding 140 by 90. And those who are diabetic, heart failure, CKD, we should be taking next step if their blood pressure reading is exceeding uh, 130 by 80. Beta blockers for compelling indication, low dose, usually it, it added to other drugs. And ensure adherence because medicine work only when we take it. So endurance, uh, sorry, adherence is extremely important. We must keep educating our people. We must keep reinforcing the importance of adherence. Only then we can achieve our desired effect. Thank you very much. This has been Professor Azizur Rahman from Medistan. I'm very keen to see you in my next video. Thank you very much.